Hi, everyone. Good well. evening. Uh, thank you all for coming to our session. Uh, we have a panel to, to present this evening on promoting open science and transparency across subdisciplines of psychology. And so we'll be featuring uh, several editors from APA journals, as well as our open science and methodology chair. So first, I'd like to share a quick overview of open science and how it factors in APA, the American Psychological Association. Uh, open science improves the transparency, accessibility, and reproducibility of science. And here I'm presenting in three different ways to um, ways that you can engage in open science practices. So for simplicity to, to provide an overview, you can look at how uh, open science aids in confirmation of hypotheses. So things like um, pre-registering your research. So being upfront about what you plan to do with your research study before you've done the research. Uh, we, there's open science practices that can aid with collaboration, things like data sharing so that others can do secondary data analysis on the data that you've collected or preprint so that folks can see the, the um, findings of your study before it's been published in a journal. And then open science can also aid in transparency. And so an example here is constraints on generality statements, which um, allows you to be very transparent about how uh, far your, your research findings extend. Some open science practices that APA has engaged in over the last several years include things like uh, open science badges. And so here I've displayed the open data badge, but one thing that was very important since a lot of the research we publish uh, reports on human um, interaction was that we have the open data protected access badge. And so that's something the APA was very active in um, advocating for. And so that, that allows you to state that you'll share your data, but it's it's um, there's protected access to it. So you have to have that data requested from you. So it's not completely open in the world. Another way that the APA has engaged in open science is through journal article reporting standards. And so these are for quantitative, qualitative and mixed methods help um, authors really think about being extremely transparent in what they're reporting in the research study. Um, we have an APA journal branded data repository through open science framework. So um, uh, if you publish an article with us and you deposit, you can deposit your data in that repository. We recently, last year, um, launched a joint psychological societies per registration of quantitative research in psychology. So this is a template. Uh, Fred Oswald was part of this as well. It was a group with British Psych Society and German Psych Society, as well as Center for Open Science and ZPED. Um, and that was to create a template that, that uh, researchers could use to pre-register their research. And then finally, we created an open science and methodology committee a few years ago. Um, and as I mentioned, Fred Oswald is our chair now. Uh, and this committee is in place to consider open science, particularly as it pertains to APA journals, and make recommendations on how um, the journal should be thinking about open science. And so, for example, one change um, that came about because of the committee's recommendation was for um, the APA core journals to sign on uh, the top guidelines. And so that's been happening throughout this year. So today uh, we'd like to specifically feature um, the ways in which different journal editors and our open science and methodology committee are engaging in open science practices. And specifically we tried to pick a subsection of um, journals to really highlight how the different disciplines engage, subdisciplines in psychology engage in open science. And so Dr. Evie will talk about um, Journal of Applied Psychology and her work there. Uh, Dr. Leach will talk about uh, the interpersonal relations and group processes section of Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. Uh, we have a recording from Dr. Yates who couldn't join us tonight, but he's the editor of Neuropsychology. And then Fred Oswald will speak more broadly about open science practices. And then we'll have a Q&A session. So we hope that several of you will be able to, to participate in that. And so I will move on to Dr. Evie now. Thanks, Rose, I appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about our kind of foray into open science um, at the Journal of Applied Psychology. Um, so I'm the editor of the journal and have about have 15 associate editors that work with me. Next slide, Rose. 
So just to give you a little bit of context about the Journal of Applied Psychology, I pulled this off of our website. Uh, we basically study the psychology of work employment. And so um, our journal focuses specifically on the cognitive, behavioral, and psychological processes at multiple levels of analysis that are related to the world of work. Uh, we focus on um, primarily research that's conducted in organizational settings, although we also do publish experimental and simulation and some methodologically based work. Um, so our context is, is somewhat unique in that we're really studying uh, people primarily in field based settings. Uh, we do publish um, largely empirical research, but we also do publish qualitative research, which I think poses some unique issues for open science. Next slide, Rose. So in terms of our policies related to open science, I took over the journal in 2020. And at that time, um, we knew that there was a, at least a, some rumblings at APA about really um, signing on to the tops and also really promoting open science. So early on, um, several team members and I wrote a piece on um, methods logical reporting and some developed some checklists we could use with the journal. Um, this is not to replace um, APA's standard jars for qualitative and quantitative, but what we do find is that some of those checklists were kind of cumbersome and, and for the type of work we do, um, we thought a, a more specific type of checklist would be helpful. So I mentioned this because it was really a nice way to get our stakeholders um, thinking about open science in a way that they could really understand and so we didn't implement this as policy, but we implemented it as best practice prior to um, the decision by APA to implement the top guidelines and be a signatory. Um, so on our website, we have um, pretty detailed information on submitting manuscripts and also open science. And we actually spent a lot of time really crafting this message. Um, open science is not something that is that common to people in industrial organizational psychology and management. And so we really wanted to make sure that our messaging was clear and concise. Um, and so several of my associate editors and I worked on a lot of language with the help of APA and really kind of um, tailored it to our unique our unique audience. And effective November 1st, we will be implementing um, the top guidelines. And you can see here, um, just as an example, the different levels at which we have decided to adopt APA. Um, I think very, um, uh, very wisely determined that the different editors could make decisions about top implementation, implementation that worked for them. Um, and required at least a level one. So on some of these, we have level two. We don't have replication listed on this table because we've always encouraged replications at the journal, um, but you can see here this, that, that we are getting ready to go live very soon. So if you talk to me in a couple of months, I'm sure I'll have some additional stories, uh, but we've done a lot of, a lot of preparatory work and, and we feel really quite prepared. Next slide. Um, kind of collaterally with um, the movement to uh, the top guidelines, one thing that I did when taking over as editor is create kind of an ancillary website that's not so much associated with the journal and it's not something that is formally endorsed by APA, but it was a way for us to really signal our values to authors, to reviewers, um, and really reach a broad audience. And so this is just a, a screenshot of our, of our website. Um, I encourage you to look at it. It's got a lot of great information for graduate students, authors, reviewers, and we deliberately have a, um, a, a sub page on open science. And on we have some really good for people who are in learning about open science. We have our logical checklist, also open science events that are happening. We have links to APA. And actually, we also have links to what other journals in our subdiscipline of psychology are doing. Um, and we've gotten really good feedback on this, um, this website as a resource, but particularly related to open science. Next slide. And so I'll just, I'll, I'll say a few things about let learn. This was um, organizers asked us to talk about. 
And one thing to say, particularly for our area, sub area of psychology, is that education is really important. And luckily, prior to um, APA's decision to implement the top guidelines, there had been numerous sessions at Division 14 talking about open science, getting people to understand what it was about. And, and we realized that there's a lot of misconceptions. People often think of it as kind of an e either or, like you have to share everything, you have to pre-register everything. So we've been really working hard um, in small ways to try to get people to understand that there's lots of ways to be open, but also to really highlight the advantages. But for us, it's really been a culture change and it's a, still a culture change in progress. Um, another thing I would recommend is just starting small. I mentioned that we started with our methodological checklist and some messaging around open science. Um, I do give quite a number of talks to universities about the journal. And so I am inserting open science slides into those presentations to get people talking about it. Um, and I also think um, that considering kind of the unique issues facing your subdiscipline is really important um, for, for industrial organizational psychology in particular, issues of data sharing can be, can be fraught with problems and in many cases um, may not even be allowed. We tend to collect proprietary data uh, and qualitative research is kind of a unique issue um, with some unique ontological beliefs that in some ways run counter to some of the tenets of open science or at least the interpretation. And so I think that poses some challenges. Um, I'd, also, I'd also encourage you to think carefully about the role of reviewers and associate editors. We're a very high volume journal. We had almost 1700 submissions last year alone. And so the, the thought of how to do this well without increasing tremendous burden on reviewers and associate editors is something that we've really given a lot of thought to. Uh, we also have given a lot of thought to how to ensure that the system is fair for all authors. Um, and that involves for us making sure that reviewers are clear on their role as reviewers as it relates to open science to make sure that people are being treated um, fairly in the process. And then um, the last thing is we did spend also a lot of time just really thinking about the nuts and bolts. There's a lot of boxes to be checked in implementing open science, uh, particularly at, um, at a journal. And so we did spend a lot of time thinking about who's gonna be checking which parts of manuscript submissions, uh, what is our peer review manager gonna be doing, what is the editor gonna be doing, what are associate editors going to be doing, and also what are reviewers going to be doing. Uh, and so I, this will be helpful. We implement our minds November 1st. Rose. Lillian, I missed that last part, but you're finished, right? Yes. Okay, good. Your audio held up very well until the end. So we're good. <laughs> All right, great. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because Dr. Uh, Leach is next and he'll talk about Journal of Social, our Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. Um, hello, everyone. Rose, can you just give me a thumbs up if my audio is okay? Great, thank you. Um, so yes, I'll speak about um, from the perspective of the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. And as maybe some of you know, social and personality psychology, but especially social psychology has maybe a unique relationship to open science. Um, and that's partly because we were at the center of um, a number of um, highly publicized scandals in psychology. And I think, um, to have this discussion for social psychology in particular, um, we have to first acknowledge um, events about 10 years ago um, that started the particular form of open science practices in social psychology. And so that was um, the um, discovery of, of longstanding years long um, research misconduct by Diedrich Stoppel in the Netherlands in 2011. Um, where a number of well-known publications um, were discovered to be fabricated. Um, and also what became clear in that process, which was that in fact, it was very, very difficult um, for any of the people who suspected that misconduct to actually expose it. It took years um, 
And so this this really was a was a was a lesson for us in um, how the lack of transparency in research practices. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that happened, which was a little closer to home at JPSP, although it was well before my time as editor there, which was in 2011 in that same year, um, Daryl Bem and colleagues um, published in our journal um, a, a paper with nine experiments um, purporting to provide evidence of um, ESP. Um, and this, of course, um, attracted a lot of criticism. And um, and uh, there were editorials written and blogs and uh, in many ways people um, focused on this article by Daryl Bem um, supporting uh, using very traditional social psychological methods and nine experiments um, to provide empirical evidence for something that many people um, believe cannot be empirically validated and so this also led to a lot of hand wringing and criticism. And so those two cases really um, fixed the field of social psychology um, on uh, research practices. And we've been pretty fixed on it for the last 10 years. Um, and in the end, I think it's led to a particular, in some ways, cultural shift toward open practices in social psychology, but also you know, quite a lot of um, tension and discussion or what have you. And many people even called the subsequent years after those two revelations in 2011 or those two controversies, uh, many people have called, uh, have said that the field is in crisis. Um, and so a number of things have happened since then, which, which I think have been really productive. And the first one is, and I think this is relevant to, to everyone, no matter what subdiscipline or discipline you're in, which is that our main society, actually, our main professional society, the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, um, uh, convened a committee and um, distributed guidelines that were, were that were really um, shared widely in 2014, and this was really a, a, a kind of consensus statement um, about the need for more open and transparent practices um, and reporting in the field. And I think in many ways it reinforced some of the messages of the journal article and reporting standards that that Rose mentioned a little while ago, which was um, <clears throat> produced by APA in 2008, but that a lot of social and personality psychologists hadn't really um, picked up. Um, and I think <clears throat> it carried forward some of those messages and updated them to some degree. And so therefore I think it's also really consistent then with the latest journal article and reporting standards um, published in 2018. And so now I think um, at the journal, um, we have the last few editors across the three sections have really been referring to the 2014 document by our professional society and also the 2018 journal article and reporting standards to refer to what I think are, are, are clearly consensual statements about best practice in the conduct of research and the reporting research of research. And then um, for my team uh, in my editorial of 2020 and in every editorial letter, we refer to those standards. Um, and we also refer to the publication manual by the American Psychological Association, which is another very important and useful document for research practices and reporting. And so in every communication that we have with authors and reviewers, we try to reinforce this consensualization of standards of practices and reporting by referring to those keystone documents. And I think this is a really important, in many ways, social and cultural dynamic of open science, and that is um, developing a consensus and agreement, whatever it is that we can agree on and consensualizing it, and then all referring to some guiding documents or statements um, in, in our communications and in our engagement and our evaluations of work. Um, and as, as the previous speaker mentioned, also getting reviewers and everyone involved in the process referring to that same stand, set of standards, basic minimal standards um, has been a major task for us um, at the journal. Uh, okay, so more specific policies. Um, we, um, all three sections of JPSP um, have endorsed uh, the level two guidelines by top. Um, and then since January 2020, uh, we also require um, upon initial submission, um, the completion of the open practices disclosure form, uh, which indicates uh, where data would be made of it, where data would be made available and where materials are available 
and code, the relevant code for programming or for analysis. And so authors must um, explain why this is not possible or why it's not advisable. So the standard is um, that people make data materials and code available. And if there are reasons um, why this doesn't make sense, then they really have to say so. And so therefore now all published articles include in the author note um, reference to where the data materials and code can be found or some explanation in those rare cases um, where it's not accessible. And so again, now in every art, in every um, issue, people are also getting this message over and over again that this is the standard. And um, it is something that all authors have to commit to upon initial submission. And I think that's been an important um, change for us. The other thing we've done specifically at the interpersonal relations and group processes section of the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology is, um, and I think this also goes to the previous speaker's point about the extra uh, labor that goes into engaging open practices documented information. And so um, for our team, because I think of our unique relationship in social psychology to this, it was important for us to have, and so um, APA was very supportive of us having three uh, methods and statistics associate editors um, who can uh, scrutinize um, initial submissions, uh, scrutinize some of that additional evidence that's presented, and in some cases, reanalyze data or perform simulations um, of data. And this has really empowered the entire editorial team to ask pertinent questions if things are unclear and to engage the material that's provided through open science in a way that's actually useful and productive in the initial um, editor's um, um, assessment of the initial submission. Um, because otherwise, um, the assessment of the material that's submitted through open science practices, the materials, the data, what have you, that actually relies on volunteer reviewers to make the effort and to have, actually have the expertise um, to engage the material that open science is now presented to us. And so we thought it was really important to get some technical support um, to our editors in those cases where it really matters. But there is a question here of, of scale um, and of volume uh, and, and how to manage um, this given um, uneven expertise and interest or motivation among reviewers. And I think that's a really important question for us given the system of peer review that our journals use, which is a voluntary system, um, where is this labor and expertise gonna come from? Um, so having lots of information and access to it doesn't serve anyone if there's no one to actually make use of the information. Um, so this is one step that we've, we, we've tried to, to take, uh, the methods and statistics associated editors, but it really is a stopgap measure. It's not really a long-term um, solution to making the most use of the extra information that we have access to. Um, we do not um, require pre-registration of hypotheses, but we have been encouraging it, um, a voluntary pre-registration. And we do, as a matter of course, encourage authors when they've been asked to uh, conduct further studies or reanalyze data or what have you, to engage in pre-registration at that stage. So we've certainly been using that as part of the editorial decision-making um, when people are conducting replications or extensions um, and, and there is a sort of a, a logic that's apparent to, to just to make that early, to make that commitment to actually pre-register um, replication studies or follow-up studies. Now, because of social psychology's unique relationship to these issues, um, I would say a good 60 to 70% of our submissions contain pre-registered studies actually. Um, and that number is going up um, every day. Uh, but there too, we have the question of quality of pre-registration. Not all pre-registrations are equal uh, in their quality. Some are very vague, some are very general. Um, and of course, um, we have had, we have had um, some cases where reviewers or others have raised questions about deviations from pre-registration or the quality of pre-registration. So that's, again, that raises the issue of making use of the information um, that's provided. Um, Okay, so I just want to mention maybe a couple of things now about um, researchers and the broader um, involvement. As I've already uh, um, mentioned, a key um, area of growth, I think, for us 
is engaging reviewers in the even application and understanding of open practices. Um, this has been a struggle so far, even we, even though we've tried to share um, what, what I think are consensual standards, uh, there's a lot of difference of opinion. And um, at the moment, I think um, it's been a little difficult because um, some reviewers are, are very committed um, to maybe what you might even call sort of level three top guidelines. And they think those are the only acceptable ones and others to none at all. And so this is introducing now another level of heterogeneity in reviews that editors have to manage and that authors have to contend with. And uh, so far, I think um, the field at least doesn't have a good um, approach to dealing with that. Um, but, but, but at the moment, voluntary peer review is highlighting where there is a lack of consensus on, on what open science practices um, are expected of authors. Um, we've also really pushed and do require authors to commit to an a priori power analysis and also with an explicit rationale for expected effect sizes. And this helps deal with uh, not genuinely a priori power analysis, because of course people can say that they've done an a priori power analysis, but if they have no real rationale for the effect size that they expect, then that a priori power analysis isn't really worth uh, the numbers that it produces. And so getting researchers to be reflective and conscientious about their practices and what design, what number of participants, um, what methods are most appropriate for reasonable expectations um, has been a really important um, thing for us to engage authors and reviewers on. And I think we're making headway there. Um, but that again has been, I think, um, relying on us sharing information and educating all of those involved in the peer review process about um, the usefulness of power analysis. And I will say, I think that the COVID effect on slowing research, which has been pretty dramatic in social psychology, has actually given us an opportunity to uh, more productively and constructively and less defensively engage authors because I think everyone's been slowed down and that slowdown has, I think, led to authors and reviewers having a greater appreciation for the effort that goes into producing research. And therefore, in some ways, it's kind of like the, the slow food movement and in many ways. I think people have had an appreciation for the quality that can be gained by slowing things down. And I think that that does open more people up to the gains of open science practices um, by sharing more, by being more reflective, um, and, and all of us engaging in a little bit more careful assessment of what we've done, why we've done it, and, and, and how convincing it is. And a central part of that for us, the last thing I'll mention is we've also been encouraging people to also engage in open and best practices of graphics. And in fact, so the previous um, panel ended with a discussion of that. And that's another thing that we really pushed that actually making data more transparent um, in graphical representation um, is another way to reinforce this idea that we all gain by sharing as much information as possible about what we've done and why. Um, and so I think I might be coming toward Maine, but that's what we've been doing at the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology to um, engage open practices and to try to, uh, to get all of those involved um, in, in a productive and constructive conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leach. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Uh, Keith Yates from the Journal Neuropsychology, and I'll be showing his video presentation. Hi, my name is Keith Yates. I'm a professor at the University of Calgary, and I'm really pleased to be part of this uh, symposium on promoting open science and transparency across subdisciplines in psychology. And I want to thank uh, the organizers, uh, and particularly Rose uh, Sokol Chang, for inviting me to be part of this. Before I get started, uh, just by way of disclosure, I want to acknowledge that I have uh, current uh, grants and research support from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation. I also get a small amount of book royalties for uh, books that I've edited or authored, and I receive an editorial stipend from the American Psychological Association. 
I'm sorry I can't join you in person. I'm speaking from my office in uh, uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I find that many people around the world know where Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver are, but may not be familiar with Calgary. And this is a picture of the lovely view across downtown Calgary to the beautiful Canadian Rockies. And the reason that I'm not with you uh, in person today is that I had the opportunity uh, to uh, take a weekend at uh, the Assiniboine Provincial Park. This is a picture of uh, that area. Uh, it's a lovely part of uh, the uh, Canadian Rockies, uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, spending the weekend there uh, because it's a really uh, lovely, lovely place with tremendous hiking, and we're very lucky to have it in our backyard in the midst of uh, this pandemic. But without further ado, uh, let me go ahead and move along. Uh, I'm going to start uh, just really briefly by uh, talking a bit about uh, what open science is. Uh, we've already uh, reviewed this uh, previous to my talk, but just to, to reiterate, uh, open science promotes transparency, integrity, and reproducibility of science. Uh, in many cases, this is done through the sharing of data with the establishment of repositories where investigators can share their data, their materials, their computer code, analytic code, and also the sharing of scientific plans, which often translates into the pre-registration of studies, uh, including in many cases, the pre-registration of data analytic plans. So how has this influenced uh, neuropsychology? For those of you who aren't familiar with neuropsychology, uh, neuropsychology is the science of brain behavior relationships. Uh, it typically focuses on how the brain is related to human behavior in both healthy as well as uh, uh, brain disordered populations. So for neuropsychologists, many of us focus on uh, groups of individuals who have a brain disorder, say a brain tumor or a traumatic brain injury uh, or uh, are affected by neurodevelopmental disorders such as learning disabilities or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Although some neuropsychologists focus uh, on healthy brains and what we can understand uh, about behavior uh, in, in healthy populations. So we've been heavily influenced by outside forces that have driven uh, the open science movement. Of course, the Center for Open Science but also funding agencies that have increasingly expected us as investigators uh, and as journal editors to promote open science. So the National Institutes of Health, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, for example, uh, have uh, promoted and required increasingly uh, that investigators uh, deposit their data, make it publicly available, make their publications publicly available, uh, and that's uh, certainly had a, a significant influence uh, in our discipline. Uh, another area or another force that's been at work is medical journals. Uh, many of the journals that we publish in as neuropsychologists uh, tend to focus on uh, medical uh, disorders or populations. And a number of those journals have also pushed in the direction of open science, uh, particularly uh, when it comes to randomized controlled trials or systematic reviews. Uh, but not limited to that. So what we've seen over the past uh, decade has been the establishment of data repositories uh, that allow investigators to share their data readily with uh, like-minded investigators. Some of these are government uh, initiated efforts such as FITFER, which is the uh, data repository initiated by NIH for investigations focused on traumatic brain injury. Uh, some of these are voluntary uh, efforts to pool data uh, and put them into available repositories, such as the Enigma group, which focuses on neuroimaging uh, and uh, genetic data and combining those across studies and making those combined data sets available. Uh, the other thing that we've seen is the establishment of many sites, uh, websites that allow for pre-registration uh, in many cases, these involve, uh, as I mentioned, randomized controlled trials, so sites like clinicaltrials.gov uh, or systematic reviews, and, and Prospero, a good example of a site uh, that's available for pre-registration and systematic reviews. Uh, but others are choosing to use preprint servers and other sites uh, to pre-register their studies. 
Uh, and in many cases, journals are increasingly willing to publish study protocols uh, that allow uh, an investigator or a team of investigators to pre-register uh, their study, including their analytic code. Uh, and uh, we increasingly see that in neuropsychology. There are barriers to open science that are not limited to neuropsychology, but certainly uh, do bear on our discipline. Uh, in some cases, research ethics uh, boards, uh, in, in individual uh, institutional review boards, or whatever they might be called at a local level, um, actually place restrictions on sharing of data. Uh, in Canada, where I'm located, uh, it is not you, uh, necessarily the case uh, that all uh, research ethics boards will endorse or allow for the sharing of data, even when it's de-identified. Uh, and that's a, a barrier that uh, we need to uh, uh, try to address uh, at a local level. Uh, we certainly also run into, uh, at times, researcher reluctance uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, sometimes it's simply the sense of, well, I worked hard to collect this data. It's my intellectual property. Uh, I don't want to give it up. I don't want to share it. Uh, that can be particularly true early in the stage of research before uh, all uh, primary uh, study hypotheses, for example, have been uh, addressed in publications. Uh, it's also the case that open science is not without cost, cost in both money uh, and time. Uh, preparing data, for example, for deposit in a depository often means creating metadata uh, uh, files and doing other forms of cleaning or uh, uh, removing of identifying information and, and similar activities. And in many cases, those are not necessarily uh, incorporated into the budgets that are available in people's research grants. Some investigators uh, don't have large research grants. Uh, they don't have the staff necessarily that can take the time uh, to uh, uh, make it happen. Um, and uh, there are a number of other barriers. There's a nice article uh, that I've referenced here that appeared in the American Sci Scientist uh, that talked about how open science isn't always open. Uh, that uh, investigators are um, sensitive to the fact, for example, that if they're working, if they're junior uh, investigators working with senior collaborators, they may want to uh, promote open science, but if their senior collaborators are not open to that, uh, there are power differentials that make it difficult. Um, some of the financial uh, limitations, some of the time limitations may fall particularly um, uh, hard on junior uh, investigators on investigators from uh, less advantaged uh, research environments. Uh, and um, we know that the cost of open access publishing uh, is really prohibitive uh, for many uh, scientists, particularly from uh, lower and middle income countries uh, that simply can't afford to pay two, three, four, ten thousand uh, dollars to publish a paper. Uh, and these fees are becoming increasingly common, even in the uh, so-called high impact journals. Uh, and really place a burden on, uh, particularly on uh, less well-funded investigators. And, and unfortunately that may mean that we are uh, open to or vulnerable to perpetuating a number of systemic barriers uh, for historically excluded groups. We really need a culture change uh, to address these sorts of concerns that provides funding and support uh, for open science initiatives uh, being able to include these sorts of costs in one's research grants, being able to have institutional support uh, for these sorts of costs, and providing appropriate incentives for them. Uh, our, uh, our academic system uh, in neuropsychology, as well as other disciplines, is really not uh, set up to reward uh, sharing. Uh, it's set up to reward individual accomplishment. Um, and uh, until we change that incentive system, it's going to be uh, difficult uh, in, in some cases to promote this. So the journal Neuropsychology that I edit um, has a number of goals to try to uh, promote open, open science and consistent uh, are consistent with uh, the American Psychological Association's framework uh, to promote uh, inclusive science. Uh, we wanna foster an open, transparent, equitable and reproducible science within the discipline of neuropsychology. And we want to do that uh, by encouraging uh, pre-registration. 
uh, promoting the availability of data, materials, and code, um, explicitly stating author contributions uh, as a way of equitably recognizing uh, the contributions that each author makes, uh, establishing reporting standards so that all of our uh, all the papers published in our journal uh, address these concerns, and promoting um, equity and diversity and inclusion as a general goal. Because I think it's fair to say that science really can't be open and transparent uh, unless it's also diverse uh, and inclusive. So what are the specific initiatives uh, that we're undertaking at the journal uh, to try to uh, promote these goals? Uh, several, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we instituted uh, open science badges uh, modeled on the Center for Open Science uh, and have begun to promote uh, uh, their appearance in the journal. Uh, although we have um, limited uptake uh, thus far with about 20 papers that have appeared with badges, we've uh, moved to make it easier for authors to request badges uh, and make it a more obvious uh, uh, opportunity for them uh, to show that they have uh, engaged in open science. Um, as part of a larger effort by uh, APA publications, we've also uh, endorsed and begun to implement the uh, transparency, and open, transparency, transparency and open science guidelines, uh, again, promoted by the Center for Open Science. Um, it was very interesting to go through this process with the associate editors uh, and deciding of uh, the, uh, the uh, different criteria uh, that are uh, part of the TOPS guidelines as to which ones we would institute as uh, disclosures as opposed to requirements. And uh, we settled on three that would be requirements in terms of reporting of the availability of code and citations. Uh, as one example, but others that are simply disclosures as to whether or not, uh, for example, data is available. Uh, but I fully expect that over the coming years, uh, we will increasingly move from having uh, simply the res uh, requirement of disclosure, the actual requirements of, of having uh, data available, of having uh, pre-registration. Uh, but I think we have to acknowledge that the field is not fully there yet. Uh, and that it's unlikely uh, that we would uh, be able to institute all the, uh, the criteria as requirements at this point. Uh, more recently, uh, we've also uh, initiated uh, the uh, Contributor Roles Taxonomy Author Contribution Statements, or CREDIT. Uh, this is a way of allowing authors uh, to explicitly state their contribution to a particular uh, paper. Um, I think this is a really important uh, uh, mechanism for, for giving credit in an equitable way and being sure that all authors have reason to claim uh, uh, authorship. Uh, for too long, I think we've put uh, over much emphasis on being first author or senior author, and then there's everything in between. Uh, yet, uh, as we move to team science and collaborative uh, science, it's increasingly important that we give uh, investigators a chance to, uh, to state clearly what their contributions have been. Uh, and we hope that credit will be a way of doing that. This sort of author uh, credit acknowledgement uh, not only promotes openness, uh, but I think greater equity uh, and is um, something that we've seen adopted by uh, most medical journals uh, already. And uh, was one of the reasons we moved in this direction. Uh, most recently, we've uh, started uh, implementing reporting standards in the journal uh, as a way of trying to, again, promote openness and transparency. Um, in addition to having the transparency and openness section in our methods, uh, sections of our papers, we have explicitly called for a detailed uh, description of participants and justification of the particular sample to try to move away from exclusively uh, Western, educated, industrialized, uh, white uh, types of samples or the so-called weird samples uh, to promote greater inclusivity and generalizability in our samples. We've also uh, begun to um, require a constraint on generality statement or something along those lines that um, speaks to whether or not the findings in the paper 
are uh, going to be generalizable beyond the sample population? Uh, if so, why? If not, why not? Uh, to be clear that um, uh, we need to be more circumspect about how generalizable our findings are and promote uh, science in a broader range and more diverse range of, of populations. Uh, the, the last initiative that I want to talk about is one that we're taking to try to promote diversity um, in the pipeline uh, for neuropsychology um, at the level of reviewers and editors, uh, because we believe that this is a way to promote uh, more scientists uh, coming from historically uh, excluded groups uh, and therefore uh, broaden the pipeline at all levels and uh, fundamentally believe that uh, promoting diversity in our discipline will also promote more open and transparent science, uh, in part because uh, it's likely to be the case that scientists, uh, reviewers, and editors from historically excluded groups are going to be more sensitive uh, to some of the issues involved in uh, generalizability, the particular sample justification, uh, and some of the methods like uh, participatory-based ba participatory community-based types of science uh, that um, traditionally neuropsychology hasn't made as wide use of. So two programs that we're starting uh, um, beginning in 2022, uh, one will be a mentored review program uh, for historically uh, excluded groups or individuals from historically excluded groups. Uh, this will be a program where we um, encourage our regular reviewers and our editorial board to identify students uh, from historically excluded groups and involve them in a mentored review process. Um, for students who don't have uh, a reviewer or editorial board member at the local institution, uh, we're going to uh, pair them with someone on our editorial board. Uh, we will uh, have them go through a structured process to do a mentored review. Um, a smaller group of mentored reviewers who uh, want to commit to a more intensive program will be identified and uh, provided uh, with a somewhat more intensive experience. Uh, the goal is to um, obviously broaden our, our reviewer uh, pool uh, in the long run. Uh, and to um, expose uh, students and trainees from historically excluded groups uh, to the reviewing process, demystify it, um, encourage them to be able to uh, do reviews for not only neuropsychology, but other journals, uh, and uh, add them eventually to our uh, editorial board. We will identify all the mentored reviewers each year uh, in acknowledgments uh, and um, hope to create a uh, student editorial board or trainee editorial board uh, that would appear on the masthead uh, for those uh, mentored reviewers who engage in the more intensive experience. The second uh, program that we're establishing is an editorial fellowship program, again, for uh, uh, junior scientists uh, from historically uh, excluded groups. Um, this is a program where we take scientists who are in the first 10 years of their career uh, and pair them with one of the associate editors or with me as the editor uh, to go through a year-long process where they essentially uh, do a, um, a fellowship that involves learning all the steps uh, in the editorial process, shepherding papers uh, through that process, uh, as well as some learning experiences got, gain, um, uh, that are geared to both uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion issues, but also the scientific uh, 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 publishing process. Uh, each fellow who completes the program will be uh, added to our editorial board. Uh, and uh, obviously the hope is uh, that in the long run, this will broaden the uh, pipeline uh, for our, our editorial board and our associate editors. Uh, and as I said uh, a number of times, I really hope that the next editor of neuropsychology uh, is uh, selected from one of the historically excluded groups uh, as we try to uh, broaden the diversity of the science, which I do believe is a way of increasing uh, openness and transparency. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for attending uh, uh, the symposium and uh, the listening to my talk. I want to acknowledge the various agencies uh, 
foundations and others that have been involved in supporting my work uh, in the United States first and, and then out in Canada after uh, I came up here about seven years ago. I'm sorry I'm not there to be able to uh, uh, answer questions, uh, but I hope you enjoy the symposium and uh, enjoy the interaction with the other presenters. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Great, and our final panelist tonight will be Dr. Oswald, who will talk about open science and his expertise within the, the discipline of psychology. Great, thanks Rose. Um, it's been great hearing everybody's comments from the perspective of their journals, and I'm coming at you uh, with a hat on, you can't see it, but I'm the chair of the Open Science uh, Methodology Committee within APA. I've been a member of that committee since it was initiated in, in 2018 when Steve Kozlowski was chair. And then um, I took over as chair in 2021. Chair is kind of a glorified title in the sense that um, we really do work as a team uh, with uh, Katie Corker, Lisa De Bruyne, uh, my fellow academic colleagues, and then uh, Annie Hall uh, as uh, APA staff. We're all working together to exchange uh, perspectives, ideas, have constructive uh, controversies, I suppose, and uh, really learn what is happening uh, within APA journals as these practices evolve, as, as the editors are learning themselves. So our ears are open, our eyes are open, and uh, I guess there's an opportunity to say, please reach out to us uh, if you have any questions. Uh, I'll just say in my email, it's foswald. F-O-S-W-A-L-D at rice.edu. And we'd love to hear from anyone listening who has open science questions, who are um, interacting with uh, APA journals. And um, we, just, uh, we just accumulate knowledge. And, and in turn, it's a two-way street, obviously, as, as we implement our own uh, charge uh, for the journals based on, based on your input. So I'll... I'll really talk in broad brushstrokes, even though uh, the devil truly is in the details um, as the editors have reflected on things. So, um, but the message, the overall message does drive us forward and, and, and seeing at a broad level how efforts are related or not related um, is really helpful to understanding open science. It's helpful to understanding psychology. It's helpful to understanding uh, the landscape of incentives and resources and processes uh, that are that are going on within the APA ecosystem. Um, not surprising to you all, um, I suppose, APA seeks to um, improve research in terms of transparency, reproducibility, and replication. Again, the devil really is in the details, but um, as, as Colin noted, it, it's spurred by uh, attention to the field in terms of the need for replication to have findings that are um, indeed um, credible and you know reproducible is a is a blanket statement just like open science is um, it has many facets I guess that's another point I want to make here is um, that um, in the service of transparency there's a whole host of practices that um, need to be considered in a multifaceted way. And that's exactly what the top guidelines are uh, that APA has established within its journals in establishing um, eight different standards in terms of uh, citation standards, uh, data transparency, I won't list them all, but uh, being transparent in terms of research and materials, uh, pre-registering and, and so on. So these, these top guidelines are, um, I guess they're called modular standards, which means they are, there are pieces and journals um, decide on the level at which they um, would like to adopt those guidelines in line with APA policy. So the level could be for authors to disclose whether they used a particular open science practice, um, or there's a requirement at, at level two that they actually do adopt it. And then um, a level three, we'll see as the culture evolves, um, to what extent are journals uh, verifying the practice is, is meeting some particular standard within the journal. But the idea, the spirit of it is really important here. 
and that is to develop culture through education, through knowledge sharing, um, and through open science itself, right? Because open science materials, um, the sharing of those materials, the practice of sharing stands to improve the quality of science. It stands to improve the way we communicate to each other and conduct research. So it's not just the improvement of the journal article and the scientific outcome, of course we want that, but it's also improvement of the process of the communication. And um, I mean, I'll, I'll explicitly acknowledge equity and inclusion in, in that um, reflection that we, we want to increase equity and inclusion through open science, through open communications. Um, the fewer barriers there are to research um, in building this community, um, the better it is, not just for, uh, again, not just for sharing, but for uh, improving knowledge and skills. We, we learn beyond the walls of our own um, institutions and even our own disciplines. So, the editors have already reflected on a number of points about open science that I think um, the audience can appreciate, but I'll, I'll, I'll single it out anyway to say that, um, as, as I had noted, open science is not a monolith. Um, it's multifaceted. Um, it's a culture as much or more than uh, the practices uh, involved. Um, the culture and the practices are, are evolving. Um, and so is the infrastructure, the resource requirements. Um, we know in general, I think it was pointed out that you know, open science sometimes sounds like it's free, uh, but it's not free in terms of money, resources, um, the time, Colin mentioned the time spent uh, that reviewers uh, uh, spend in terms of their, their expertise uh, that they bring to bear um, if they have that expertise. So, so we're all educating ourselves while we're reviewing the practices we're engaging in. So it's a many faceted um, enterprise that we're, we're nonetheless committed to with all our arrow, arrows pointed in, in the right direction to stimulate a better research process, uh, better research outcome and better researchers, um, in again, in terms of education. So I risk, as you can tell, I risk repeating myself there, but I wanted to um, kind of highlight what I think is important to the Open Science Methodology Committee that, that we're here, we're listening ear. We, um, we wanna learn and, and grow the culture as much as the knowledge. We wanna learn discipline specific concerns. Um, and those concerns will evolve um, as well, right? That um, sometimes something that uh, may be shared one way, may be shared a different way over time or different um, strategies for sharing materials and data um, come up over time as, as people engage in open science practices. I guess another point I wanna um, to highlight as, as we implement open science is how those behaviors or, or the, the, the incentives, the reputations, those can be viewed through different lenses, multiple um, fruitful lenses. So, so the journal is one lens, uh, and, and, and that's clearly important. I, I serve as Associate Editor at Journal of Applied Psychology, working with uh, and for uh, Lillian Eby and her editorial team. It's been really great, um, just FYI. But uh, it does require, as I'm learning in the trenches, um, the assignment of open science-related responsibilities to every part of the journal. So you want to implement top guidelines well how, what are the, what are the, what's the responsibility of the authors, uh, the managing editor, the manuscript coordinator, the reviewers, and, and so on. And, um, and so I, I think you heard every, every journal is dealing with, with those operational uh, decisions, which are not, are not trivial. Um, again, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road and where, um, you know, we have a broad view and a broad mandate um, for open science methodology, but we want to hear those details and learn across uh, across uh, every journal as they invest in those details. Um, so I'll say uh, two more things. Um, one is uh, that uh, the open science, in addition to implementing the top guidelines, uh, the Open Science Methodology Committee um, has also uh, developed and, 
in collaboration with uh, several other professional societies, uh, pre-registration template. Um, those societies, by the way, are the British Psychological Society, uh, the Leibniz Institute for Psychology um, in, in tandem with the German Psychological Society and, and the Center for Open Science. Uh, this pre-registration template is fairly detailed. In fact, it aligns with JARs. Uh, they're sort of a, a wiring diagram uh, between the components of pre-registration and the components of JARs. And the idea there is to help ensure a more comprehensive uh, research development process. Uh, just like we, we take a grocery list uh, to the store so we don't forget uh, the guacamole, um, we also want to use the template as a way to um, remind ourselves of the key components as we engage in planning. Uh, because pre-registration is, after all, planning. And planning is uh, a good thing to focus on and improve, right? Regardless of the top guidelines, um, if open science stimulates uh, the planning, the pre-registration template stimulates planning, um, that, that all sounds like uh, good, good work to be done in the, in the early phase of your, of your research. Um, and then finally, the road ahead for open science methodology, we're, we're working on appropriate citation for computer software and code. Um, this is in line with the credit framework that was mentioned earlier, that all parts of the scientific enterprise should be um, recognized and, um, and uh, rewarded. Uh, we, should, we should be thinking about all this in terms of promotion and tenure committees as well. Um, we're also, uh, you know, APA is considering uh, more about, about pre-registration friendly journals, ones that are uh, ramping up their efforts even, even further or those that haven't started um, and want to start. How do we uh, create that on-ramp um, as, as the Open Science Methodology Committee. And then we're, we're continuing our open science education and, and, and exposure through, um, through various ways of uh, broadcasting our efforts uh, through blogs, through social media, through, through short articles, uh, through communication with, with editors um, and, and through authors themselves uh, educating us, we can then relay that to others and, and further educate in that, in that reciprocal relationship I've been, I've been emphasizing. Um, so I will stop there. I, I look forward to the Q&A, but I hope uh, you all appreciate what all these journal editors are doing, the hard work um, that, that they're going through. And um, it, it really is an honor to support and it, it's a responsibility to support. Um, and it's enjoyable. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn things over for the Q&A session to Dr. Peggy Christodis, who's um, in the science director at the American Psychological Association. And uh, we've been told that people can either uh, raise their hands to ask a question verbally, or you can put it uh, in the chat feature. Yes, hi everyone. Um, I want to thank our panelists for their presentations and as well as our audience for being here on a Saturday. Um, as Rose mentioned, if you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can type it in the chat box. I also have um, a ton of questions that I've kind of been gathering actually over the last year because I do, I do a lot of work in open science. And so I've heard a lot of things. So while the audience is maybe um, thinking of questions they can type in, I can begin with a couple of questions uh, that I have. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot about is um, <clears throat> how perhaps the transparency of research, uh, although it's important, is there a dark side <laughs> to open science and the transparency it requires of researchers? Um, could it open up scientists to bad things like data theft, uh, public criticism, you know, like Twitter wars and things of that nature, or even um, misuse of data in the hands of the wrong people who may not have the skill set to work with these data. What do you say to people who are reluctant to engage in open science because they have these types of fears? And that's for any Yeah, I'm of happy ours. to chime in. Yeah, for, yeah I'm happy to. It looks like 
Okay, there you really, are, Lillian. Really, really important, Peggy. And I think particularly, sorry, I just was saying, I think the issues you raise are really important. And particularly for people who are not familiar with open science, I think this is unfortunately what they sometimes think open science is. Um, I also think, unfortunately, there are there are situations where these type of bad behaviors happen, uh, threatening requests for data, um, shaming authors who don't share data on social media. So I think there's there's really a need for some collegial normative standards for open science. And actually, Fred and I are working on just a short piece for our professional association around this very issue. Um, because sometimes the requests come from people outside psychology who may not have the type of expertise to actually analyze the data or work with the data and come from a culture where it can be very threatening to a junior author to feel like they have to share data. So these really real issues, I think the base rate is pretty low, but all it really takes is a one bad experience, I think, to make people feel really nervous about open science. But I'm curious what, what Colin and, and Fred have Colin, Fred, do you have anything more to add about this uh, dark side? <laughs> I asked Brian Nosek about this as well, and he thinks that it's not really that bad, that, you know, there may be an occasional case here and there, but usually any kind of criticism is actually quite constructive or people are just asking for maybe additional details uh, or explanation. Um, so I, I hope that alleviates people's <laughs> fears. Um, it looks um, like, oh, I can ahead. say maybe one, one thing about it, if you like, um, mm -hmm. I think I actually wrote about this in the editorial that I, that I posted. And I think the concern is based on a view, I think of science that isn't quite right. And that is that one, once the research is done or once it's written up or even once it's published, that somehow it's done and it's never done. It's, it's, a, it's a continuing conversation. And so I think once we sort of view science in that way, then even if somebody you know mis misanalyzes or misrepresents what we've done, um, that's just a, a way that the conversation continues. So I think we shouldn't shy away from from those kinds of things. We should engage them head on and open up the conversation and not be afraid of of where it takes us. And I think that's what openness and transparency actually enable. So I think the opposite is true. The more open and transparent we are the more openly and transparently and uh, and uh, principally we can engage um, in those conversations with whoever will, is willing to to engage with us. So I actually think it's freeing actually it's not it's not limiting in that way. There's nothing to fear there. Yeah, I think that's a really great way to look at it. It looks like we have a question from an audience member. Um, we're going to see if we can get her to speak. Claudia, are you able to ask your question? You might have to let me see. Claudia, are you there? It looks, yeah, wait, hold on. One second, guys. I can't seem to get her. No, well, unfortunately, for whatever reason, I can't seem to um, get that to work. So let's go on with some additional questions. Um, some of this has to do with more open access related things. Um, one person had, has asked in the past, the lack of quality control, question mark. Um, new open access journals may not have the same perception of legitimacy as established printed journals. Open access journals do not always have the same level of peer review as established printed journals. Is this actually true? And, and what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> Personally, I, I lack the um, experience in working within open access journals. I'll say that my experience in submitting to open access journals um, has been very positive. Um, and I say that regardless of the decision, um, that, that whether it was accepted or rejected, my experience in you know, navigating uh, uh, established open access journals 
has been, um, I've received good, good timely reviews. Um, I, I don't have any, I mean, these are broad impressions. I don't, I don't recall the reviews being um, remarkably better or worse, um, you know, that they were, they were fairly standard. Um, I thought it was, I, I, you know, I think those, those processes were, were in place. There, there's also the, um, you know, that we live in the, in the internet ecosystem now where um, there, there's positive aspects and negative aspects for the science, right? The, the negative aspect, I'll, I'll, I'll do the bad first to get it done, is, uh, is that is the misinformation aspect, right? That, that something did not receive a quality review and, and yet still was published and then gets promoted as, as something that was credible research. We see that all the time in peer reviewed research, let alone open access. That's a reality. Um, the positive aspect is that we, we also within our ecosystem um, give papers reviews post publication to, to Colin's point that science is a continued conversation. The journal might be like this, you know, the fly trapped in amber analogy comes into comes to mind, but, but with communication uh, comes not only an understanding of, of that research, but an understanding of what research should be following it. And um, I just think we're, you know, we're all operating off of our histories and our historical ways of thinking about science. So, so I think with um, open access journals and new technologies, we'll, we'll, you know, we're still, we're here we are trying to figure this out, right? But um, I think um, the ecosystem is, is overall, is overall positive, but certainly that's, Certainly, that's a concern. I, I'd be curious what others think. Well, if um, Dr. Leach and Dr. Eby don't have anything more to add, we have a lot more questions. Um, can you say a few words about qualitative research? And what are some of the unique issues or challenges related to open science for qualitative research? Anyone have anything to say about? So I'll say a couple of things here. Sure, sure. Uh, I think and one in particular is that do you have it's not in terms of it being part of the kind of epistemological beliefs of that type of research? Um, also, qualitative research tends to um, evolve over time. So the idea of pre-registering, I think, is can be different. Interview protocols develop and change as you do your interviews or you do your um, observations in the field. So it just poses some unique issues regarding pre-registration. Um, and I also think that one of the reasons that um, open science practices have become common particularly in my subdiscipline is around parking or hypothesizing after the results are known, which isn't really, that doesn't have the same meaning for qualitative research, which often doesn't start with a priori hypotheses. So I do worry a little bit about badges and other ways to recognize open science that could be disadvantageous to qualitative researchers, particularly in a field like mine, that tends to undervalue, I think, qualitative research. So I think those are just some of the initial thoughts on qualitative. That's great, thank you. Um, I have another question. In your experience, um, what has been more difficult to do? Teaching our new generation of psychologists to engage in open science practices or convincing older psychologists like myself who went to graduate school in a, a pre-open science era to engage in open science? Um, where have you seen maybe the most resistance? Uh, um, any any um, experiences with that? <laughs> um, I can... I can say something about that. I think um, I remember um, 
those controversies that I mentioned in 2011, um, when the first one broke of Diedrich Stoppel's misconduct, I was actually at um, a summer school and um, there was really a generational split. And I think I've seen that over and over again. And I think there really is a generational divide that younger people, recent PhDs um, and graduate students, um, I think mainly because they're actually engaged in these social media communities that discuss these issues uh, much more often um, are usually much better informed um, about, about open science practices um, and have a particular commitment to them. And they've kind of had a, an alternative socialization um, to research than um, in graduate school. That's probably also because of um, the way that science has, has been popularized in ways for this generation that maybe wasn't true in the past. And so, um, I don't know, my experience has been a real generational um, shift um, and there is, a, there is a bit of a divide. Um, and we certainly see that um, in reviewers um, and in authors. And um, it's something we're, we're having to, to work through. Um, and, um, you know, it is tough. And I think, I think one thing that's maybe important to acknowledge is, of course, as you mentioned, that, you know, the training and education that you get at whatever stage is what you build your whole rest of your scaffold, your understanding onto that. And so it's hard to let go. If you let go of that, then you let go of a lot. And so I think we all have to acknowledge that that fundamental changes in how we think about science, what we think are good practices, um, are maybe not so easy for a lot of us who, who scaffolded a lot on top of what we initially learned. But I think it's also the case that the truth is that many of us were taught things that now look incredibly naive and wrongheaded. And um, it's also important for us to be really honest and open as we can um, about common practices that we were taught, informal practices that we were taught, intuitive ways of understanding uh, and, and practicing that we were taught that make no sense. And I think it's really important on the, on the older generation to, to be as upfront as possible about, um, about what, was, you know, what was problematic. Um, in the way that we were socialized and the way that we also maybe even socialized younger people. So I think there is a way that there, that, that generational divide is gonna have to get solved for us all to really get on the same page and, and work together on these issues. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience. They ask, what role should tone take in open science conversations? Um, does delivery matter, right? Some people may be very aggressive and demanding that you engage in open science. Um, what do you say to people like that? What, what, what sort of tone should we have um, in order to encourage people to really want to be part of this movement? So I think there are a variety of tones, uh, but, but positive tones, but one tone would be the fact that um, open science practices um, accrue to the author as much as, or to the researcher as much as to the journal. And so um, don't you want as an author, or as an early career re researcher to engage in these practices that do, um, generally speaking, again, open science is not one thing, but do generally make your work um, more accessible, useful to others. There, there's research showing that those who share their data, they, they, the, those data sets tend to get cited and that, that then brings credit to the, to the researcher. Um, also in, in, a, in a researcher um, handling data requests, if you've already shared in the open science uh, spirit, but also in, in practice, it, 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 it's, uh, perhaps even routine to, to honor data requests and kind of uh, tailor it to a tailor what you've already shared to a specific request. So there, there are other ways to answer that question in terms of tone. Like um, uh, one other I'll, I'll mention quickly is just what we've said about social media, you, you know, uh, being a being a subtext or a subtweet uh, for some some of the uh, open science activities that are going on. I would like to think that the more we experience open science as a culture, um, the better we will be at uh, handling open science conversations like data requests and like any um, 
conversation that has some element of difficulty, like in, like Lillian mentioned early career researcher feeling threatened, there needs to be multiple people at the table talking, not just not just two people uh, duking it out. There needs to be multiple minds at play to inform um, to inform those issues. But um, I think everyone here is an optimist um, in improving our practices and uh, taking on these challenges. Yes, thank you. Um, I have another question. Can open science help or hurt scholars who come from historically excluded or disadvantaged groups? I did hear Dr. Yates mention in his talk, and he's not here, but he did say that, you know, open science can be, for example, financially costly. So how do we help these groups um, to engage in open science practices? So I'll, I'll, I'll just say something quickly here that, that I just, I, I think um, there, there are a variety of, of angles to this. Um, one, is, one is simply money, you know, having money for the, uh, to be published in open science journal. Sometimes there are, there are publication fees. So how do, we, how do we help each other navigate that, that barrier, you know, sometimes it's a barrier, sometimes it's not. It's, it's like, you know, journals can be flexible, libraries um, can provide funds, and, and sometimes researchers don't know that. So, um, you know, these are, that's the sort of barrier for everyone, but for underrepresented uh, minorities, uh, first generation college students, first generation graduate students, um, they're trying to figure out these, uh, the, the ropes, and uh, they, they, they may not come as easily. In fact, the data probably show they don't come as easily without role models and infrastructure. So I think we, you know, open science is not a, a one person game. Uh, we, we need to support each other and, and you know, with, with our concerns and, and um, need for diversity within our research. Um, you know, together, um, we need that mutual support to surmount barriers. But embedded in that question is, is the reality that there are um, needs to navigate open science. You're not, you're not born knowing open science. So, so we need to um, firm, that, firm, firm that up and, and, and with, the, with the concern for um, diversity, equity, inclusion. Great, thank you. Um, can I also add something to that, Peggy? Of course. <clears throat> so I, this is, I mean, this is going to look like this is my favorite rhetorical trick, and maybe it is, but I'm going to do it anyway. I think this is another example where the truth is actually the opposite of, of the way that question, of the way we might think about it. And that is, I think, <clears throat> if you're working in a resource uh, poorer environment, then actually being very planful, being very open, and being very transparent is actually an advantage. If you know you have few resources to spend, then spending them in a more informed, planful, open way is actually smarter. And I actually think that the, the worst abuses in the least open science have actually been performed by the most resource rich places and people because data is cheap, participants are cheap, and you get into a kind of a factory mentality. So I actually think this is another example where um, you know, the opposite is true that in fact, um, fewer resources means you have to be more careful with them. And if you're going to deploy them, you want to deploy them in the best way possible, the most convincing way possible. And, and I think open science does that. Um, the other thing about that is, and I think this is related to one of the questions in the chat by Gabriella, and that is also if we're studying um, um, minoritized or hard to reach populations, then the same thing applies. If there's only a small group of people who we're studying, we may not want to generalize to everyone. You may not be able to replicate 10 times, but you know that in fact, these participants or this method or this group of people is a precious resource and you want to treat them in the, as the precious resource that, that they are, which means that you have to think very carefully about your methods and what methods work best for maybe that one or two shots that you get to do this study right. So again, I think these are these. I, I think these concerns are really, really important. But I think there's nothing inherent in open science that makes those things more difficult. And if anything, they can actually be resources um, 
to 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 up to um, steady, hard to reach, or 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 um, small um, or otherwise um, not typical sort of university student populations, and they can actually empower people with fewer material resources to do higher quality research. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm really glad that you're able to see things in a more optimistic way. I think people, when they see a challenge, may sometimes think, oh, this is, I don't know about this, this is hard, and, and they look at it in a more pessimistic way. But like you've mentioned a few times, you have to look at it in a more optimistic way. And um, thank you also for answering Gabriella's question um, in your response. Um, so we have about uh, four minutes left, so maybe just a couple more questions. Another question that I've heard quite often is, how have contracts with publishers, like the one between um, Elsevier and the University of California, that's one example, how has that contributed to open science efforts? Anyone want to tackle that one? <laughs> well, I, it's hard for me to con make this connection. I'll, I'll start and see if I can get there. So um, I'm, I actually um, chair the, the library committee at, at Rice University where they themselves entered a, a negotiated agreement with Elsevier in tandem with a, a, a a, a, I don't know what their formal name is, but a, a partnership of, of universities in the, in the South and, um, you know, got, um, saved money for sure on the collections um, to, to then um, uh, ensure wider access uh, to the extent they would take some of that savings and expand um, other, into other materials that are available. There was a little bit of trade-off with Elsevier and, and maybe, maybe some other publishers they were working with in that some collections were, the trade-off was they, they, they saved money, but it was not a permanent acquisition. They would have to consistently pay for, for access. Um, I don't think I bridged the gap to open, <laughs> to open science there. Um, but the goal is to, um, you know, in the spirit of open science, just generally make science accessible to academics. I mean, that's what that's what academics is all about. And to have uh, a lack of access uh, to publications um, to the very academics that that may well be contributing to those journals and and yet not have access. That that's that would be a sad irony. So. So it is a, it is a, it is a struggle, but I, I do think it serves the, um, the spirit and 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 the practice of open science to have access to these materials. Um, you know, preprints um, are helpful as well, in and postprints to the extent those are allowable. So so that that ecosystem is expanding. Maybe others have thoughts here. Well, we have about a minute left, so I, I really have to ask this one last question. Um, if you if you could look into the future, what do you think open science might look like in say 10, 20, even 50 years from now? Um, what new open science practices, technologies, or communities might you see taking hold? That's a big question. Maybe that's something that we should all ponder. <laughs> what will it look like? Um, I think we've made tremendous advances just in the last few years. So maybe in another 10, you'll see uh, more use of the open science framework, more open access, all of the, all this good stuff. So I'm going to hand it back over to Rose. Um, and that's going to conclude um, the Q&A. Thank you for all those engaging questions and the answers that you all provided. And thanks to everyone for coming out, like we said, on a Saturday evening. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot going on this weekend. So it was nice to spend this time with you all talking about open science and uh, how psychology has engaged within that practice. Thank you to our panelists for being part of this tonight.
Thanks, Rose. Great. Thanks, Rose. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.